Amen. The title of our study today is called The Opportunity of Adversity. Now, it has been said that a person's true nature is revealed at times of their greatest adversity. When everything goes wrong, that's when the real you shows up. (laughs) And we've all experienced this in some way, shape, or form. Whether we are experiencing adversity because of choices that we've made or we're experiencing adversity because of something that is completely out of our control. The one thing that we have in common, though, is that regardless of where your adversity comes from, what's important is how we respond to it. Why? Because adversity always presents us with a revelation and a choice. The revelation of adversity is that it expresses what you really believe is true. That's what comes out in seasons of adversity. What you really believe shows up. Even if you call yourself a believer and you've been a Christian for a long time, when you hit times where everything is falling apart, what you really believe to be true will show up. Oh, I hold the word of God. I believe the word of God and God is my rock. We'll see. (laughs) Right? You enter into a season where God really is all that you have, and you learn, God, you are a firm foundation. But we don't find that out until we go through seasons of, everybody say it with me, adversity. The second thing that adversity presents us with is a choice, and that choice is what we choose to do when we experience a setback in life. This is especially true when it comes to our walk with the Lord. Because God will sometimes allow adversity into your life to reveal what's really in your heart or to expose destructive patterns in your life or destructive things that you run to as an escape in your life. That that frustrates me sometimes, many times, if I'm honest with you. I'm like, God, why wouldn't you, why would you allow adversity into my life? Why can't it be that when you come to know Jesus, all of a sudden life is just good? Roses and rainbows. You don't have an issue ever. But oftentimes, as you, many of you know, when you give your life to Jesus, life gets harder. <laughs> and some of you are like, last time I heard a preacher talk, they said it was going to get easier. <laughs> and it just got harder. But here's the thing. James talks about this. He says, do not be surprised when you enter into seasons of adversity. Why? Because God uses those things to craft something in you. And many of us this morning are running away from the crafting that God wants to do in you. You sit here this morning and go, God, I want to be used by you. God, I want to have a purpose. God, I want to have a calling. God, I want to live for more than just the American dream. If that's true, then allow God to put you into the furnace. Oh, I'm talking to somebody. Because we want to be used, but we don't want the flames. We want to be fashioned, but we don't want the fire. We want to be purified, but we don't want the process. If you want to be used by God, you have to go through the flame. You have to go through the test of adversity. But the blessing of the test of adversity is exactly what we see with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because they stood in the flames, but they were not burned. They stood in the midst of the fire, and their clothes were not scorched. When they exited the fire, they didn't even smell like smoke. That is what happens when you allow God to take you and to put you into a season of adversity. Will it be uncomfortable? Absolutely. But when you come out on the other side of that, you will be fashioned into a weapon for heaven. You will be fashioned into the person that God is calling you to be. You will be a weapon against the enemy. And what's even greater is that you will be able to help those who go into that same flame. It's a whole other mindset that we have as believers when we think about adversity. And one of the things that I'm learning is that God loves to respond to adversity. In fact, Scripture is filled with all kinds of examples of God responding to the adversity that his people go through as they trust him in hard times. But unfortunately, one of the things that I've especially found in my life and what I've seen often in the lives of others is that when we go through hard times, trusting God is usually not our first 
option. <laughs> I know for me it's not. I usually end up complaining. God, why? How come, Lord? I thought this was supposed to be great. I thought this was supposed to work. I thought this was supposed to be easy. And I end up complaining. Now, understand this, that any time when you enter into a season of adversity and, you're, and you begin to complain, and I'm not trying to make light of the seasons of adversity, I'm not trying to make light of the hard times, but I am saying that from personal experience, when you go through hard times and your, op, your first option is complaining, you will usually end up apologizing later. Because what happens is that God always comes through. And one of the things that i found to be true in my own life is that when I complain in seasons of adversity, here's what I found. It doesn't produce any life in you. When you're sitting there mad at God, screaming at God, or cussing at God, whatever it may be, let's just be honest with it. It doesn't produce any life. It doesn't produce any understanding. But the seasons of my life where I've gone through adversity and I've said, God, I don't understand. I don't know why. I don't know how. I don't know how to solve this. But I trust you. That's where we find what it says in the book of Philippians, that you have a peace that surpasses all understanding. That's where we find joy in the midst of everything falling apart. You still have a smile on your face, not because things are working out, but because you trust the God who is still in control over everything on planet Earth. That's where the joy comes from. It's not by allowing yourself to sink into this hole of complaining and despair, but it's saying, God, I'm standing on the firm foundation of your word. I'm standing on the firm foundation of your promises. I'm standing on the firm foundation that you love me, that you care for me, that you're going to see me through this, that all things are going to work out for those who love you and trust you. God loves to respond to adversity. But I will say this, he responds in his time. <laughs> That's the only caveat to all of this. <laughs> it's always in his timing. It's usually not in our timing, but it will be in his timing. But what I can promise you is that he will show up. And the reason why God loves to show up in seasons of adversity is because it's his opportunity to show us more about who he really is. And so in our time today, I'm going to talk about how we can view our, the adversity in our lives as an opportunity to know more about God as we look at Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. So our main points are going to be, the first one is adversity reveals his character. The second is that adversity reaffirms his faithfulness. And the third is that adversity shows us his power. Now, the context of Exodus chapter 6 is that Moses is coming back from a setback. <laughs> He's coming back from his first failed attempt at getting Pharaoh to let his people, the Hebrews, go. In fact, this is something that God told Moses to do. God told Moses, hey, I'm going to make you the, the deliverer of my people who have been enslaved for over 400 years. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, and you're going to tell him to let my people go. And Moses is like, okay. <laughs> I'll go, and he goes, and he says, Pharaoh, you need to let God's people go, and Pharaoh's like, no, <laughs> ain't going to happen, and as a result of Pharaoh's refusal, Moses is experiencing some intense adversity, and the reason why he's experiencing this adversity is because after Pharaoh said no, he made life a whole lot harder for the Hebrews in Egypt and even the Hebrews themselves no longer supported Moses and his plan for freedom. This left Moses very frustrated and discouraged, and he went to the Lord and complained. And he said, Lord, why have you brought this trouble on these people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. That's what Moses said to God. And here's how God responded. Look with me at verses 1 through 4 of Exodus 6. It says, then, Moses, then the Lord said to Moses, 
Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will deliver them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. For I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. This brings us to our first point, which is, which is adversity reveals his character. You see, God responds to Moses' discouragement by showing him, by telling him that this setback was actually a setup for what God wanted to do. But Moses couldn't see that. And many times, in the same way for us, when we go through setbacks in our lives, we respond like Moses, where we're like, God, I can't see this. I can't see the good in this. This is especially true if God is calling you to do something. Maybe you've been there before, where God gives you a passion to do something. He puts something on your heart to do. He calls you out to do something specific. And, and, and you get the courage to step out in faith and to do what he's calling you to do. But instead of being met with success, you're met with adversity. You're met with a setback. And then you begin to think, you begin to ask yourself, did I make the right choice in doing this? Did I really hear that from God? Was that really God or was that the pizza I had last night? Was that really him? Like Moses, we have to understand that when God calls you to do something, it doesn't mean that you won't experience bumps in the road. Because the truth is, is that anything meaningful that you want to do for the Lord in this life, it will always experience. You will always face adversity. If you're seeking to do anything for the Lord, you're going to face some adversity. This is even true when it comes to our personal lives when we're seeking to walk in obedience to the Lord. For example, in Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, How can a young man cleanse his way? It says, By taking heed according to your word. Now, if you just glance at this scripture, you could assume that cleansing your way seems really simple. But what we can miss is that cleansing your way actually means this. It means that we have to unlearn destructive patterns by applying God's word to our lives. That's what cleansing your way means. Now, if you seek to do that, if you seek to cleanse your way and walk in obedience to the word of God, you're going to be met with adversity from your flesh. Because your flesh is going to push back and say, no, I'm the one in charge here. And that's where we have to respond and say, no, I'm not subject to you. You're subject to me as I follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. But our flesh resists. So the point that I'm making there is that adversity doesn't always mean that you're doing something wrong. In fact, sometimes it's confirmation that you're doing something right. And as we see in our text today, Moses was doing something right. He was doing the right thing. And God was seeking here to encourage him. And as he encouraged him, he reminded him that he is the same God who appeared to his great ancestors. But then God says something really interesting in verse 3. He says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. Now, to understand why this is significant, we have to look at the Hebrew language. Because the term God Almighty in Hebrew is El Shaddai. And it means that God has all power to create, provide, and to sustain. And up until this time, that's all that the Hebrews knew about God. They knew he had all power. He knew that he could provide. And they knew that he made them a promise that he was going to bring them to this new land in Canaan. That's all that they knew. But when God says that they don't know me as Lord, the term Lord here isn't the same as El Shaddai, but it's the Hebrew word for Yahweh or Jehovah. And the name Yahweh is called the covenant-keeping name of God. In other words, God is telling his people, you knew me as the God who made the promise, but now you're going to know me as the God who keeps his promises. 
And in this moment, God is introducing a new aspect of his character to his people. But I need you to catch this, understand this. That the Hebrew people wouldn't have known this about God if it wasn't for this moment of adversity. If it wasn't for the adversity that they were facing in this moment, they wouldn't have known this about God. And one of the things that I find to be so true is that the things that we don't know about God, we actually find out in seasons of adversity. Many of us who have trusted the Lord found out that he is a provider because we went through seasons where all we had was Jesus and he came through. Many of us know that he's a protector, that he's a healer because we went through seasons where we had nothing but Jesus and he came through for us. That's how we figure that out. But you wouldn't know that about God if you didn't go through a season that was difficult. And many times as Christians, we always want to remain on the mountaintop with God. We want to remain in the, the experience where there's tears running down your face and you're just, oh man, I love you, God, I love you, God, oh man, I love you, God. There's nothing wrong with the mountaintop. But when we look, as I've heard it said before, that nothing grows on the mountaintop. You can go to a mountaintop, any mountaintop that we have here in Colorado Springs, and there's not much growing up there. But where the soil is rich and where things grow is in the valley. Some of us need to allow the Lord to take us into the valley. You want to grow in your walk with God? Allow him to take you to the valley. The valley is where the soil is rich. The valley is where things are dispersed, nutrients are dispersed, and that's when things grow is when you go through the valley. This is how David was able to say, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For your rod and your staff, they come from me. You are with me in the valley. David wouldn't have known that if he never got a chance to walk through the valley. You and I wouldn't know that God is a healer, a provider, a sustainer if we had never gone through the valley. There's nothing wrong with the mountaintop. But if your goal is to stay at the mountaintop where you just feel so, oh, I feel so good and my feelings are hitting, oh, man, it's great. That's really going to stunt your growth as a believer. You've got to go into the valley to grow. That's where character is produced. That's where faith is developed. And let me just tell you, when we talk about developing faith, faith is rarely about how you feel. It's rarely about how you feel. Faith is about saying, this is what this book says about God, and I'm going to believe it. That's faith. It's rarely about, oh man, I need all my circumstances to work out. I need everything to be as it is. No, no, no. Faith is saying, God, you said it here, so I'm going to believe it in my heart and in my mind. Amen. And when the enemy comes and tries to say, you know, God really doesn't care about you, I'm raising what we call in Ephesians 6, the shield of faith. And I'm saying, no, he does. He died on the cross over 2,000 years ago, and he didn't do that to ignore me. He didn't do that to put me away. He did that because he loves me, and he's present with me in the valley that I'm facing right here, right now. That's who our God is. In fact, another example of this is in Genesis chapter 16. We see a woman who was named Hagar who was facing a difficult situation because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. She was being treated unfairly, and as a result, she had to flee from them, and she had to flee into the desert. And she had no way of surviving, and she was also pregnant at the time as well. And she was eventually going to die out there if nobody came to her aid. And in that moment, God came to her aid in the desert and saved her life. And after, after God had saved her life in the desert, she, Hagar said this about God. She said, you are the God who sees. And the crazy thing about that, about Hagar saying this, is because she already knew about God because she was in Abraham's camp. She already knew about God. But what she didn't know is that God saw her situation. What she didn't know is that God knew how she felt. What she didn't know that God saw her perspective. And he didn't just observe it, but he provided a solution. And in the same way for us, God sees you today. 
He sees your perspective. He sees how you feel. He sees what was done to you, and he does not ignore it, but he's going to provide a solution for it. Why? Because he loves to respond to adversity. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He hasn't brought you this far to abandon you. Some of you sitting here today are like, why am I still alive? Because God has more for you. If he brought you this far, he's not, he didn't bring you this far just to leave you to your own devices. He didn't bring you this far just to abandon you someplace. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. He has a calling on your life. Don't you understand that what God puts, where God puts his spirit, he puts his spirit there for a purpose and a plan. Meaning that if you are a believer right now, right here, in fact, let me put it this way. If you have breath in your lungs right now, God has a purpose and a plan for you. You are not a waste of space. You are not here just taking up time. God has a purpose and a plan for your life if you're breathing right now. And so the opportunity of adversity is that we get to see more of his character, more of who he is than in in any other time in our lives. Our next point is that adversity reaffirms his faithfulness. Look with me at verses 5 through 8. Get there real fast. It says, verse 5, it says, And I have also heard, this is God speaking, he says, And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians uh, keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arms and with great judgments. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into a land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. Now God here in this moment in these verses is listing off the things that he's not only done for them, but the things that he's going to do for them. And he's he's really demonstrating how he's going to be faithful to the Hebrews before they leave Egypt. But we catch up to them, to the Hebrews, after they leave Egypt. This is what's written about them in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 34. It says, Has any other God dared to take a nation for himself out of another nation by the means of trials, miraculous signs, wonders, war, a strong hand, a powerful arm, or terrifying acts? Yet this is what the Lord your God did for you in Egypt right before your eyes. And so what this scripture is talking about is that Do not forget how God has been faithful to you. This is what God has done for you. And one of my mentors growing up used to tell me, do not forget how God has been faithful to you in your past because it will be an anchor for you in your future. It will be an anchor for you in your present circumstance. And so he told me, write those things down, journal it. Because you will will experience a season of discouragement at some point in your life. Even as a believer, you will experience something that has you down. And one practical way to encourage yourself is to write down, how has God been faithful to me in the past? And I'm not just saying in that moment of adversity. I'm saying like when God does something for you, write it down in a journal so that you can go back and read it later. And encourage yourself and go, wow, if God was faithful back then, he's going to be faithful right now. If he came through back then, he's going to come through right now. That's the benefit of remembering how God has been faithful to us in our past. In fact, one commentator said, when we are in a low place and it seems that finding God is difficult, remembering what he has done for us in the past helps us to trust that God will meet us in our present circumstances too. And what I love is that in the NIV version, it gives us a little bit more description about verse 8 when God is making this promise. He says here that God swore with an uplifted hand. In other words, God swore by an oath on his own name that he was going to fulfill the promise he made to the Hebrews. 
Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 through 18 says, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed by an oath, that by two, thing, two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Now, when we examine Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, that word consolation actually means a comfort received by a person after a loss or disappointment. Now, for us as believers, the consolation we have are the promises of God. They are a strong comfort for us in times of loss, when we experience disappointment or even adversity. And the reason why they are a strong consolation for us, the reason why they're an anchor for us, is because God can't lie. (laughs) What we see written in this book, God will do. What we have here is not just ink and paper. It's not just some novel. But these are the promises of God. Don't let anyone tell you that this, you know, discourage you because this book was written by man. Let me tell you, man might have held the pencil, but the Spirit told them what to write. It came from God. And so if you find it in this book, God is going to do it in your life. And that's why when you, and everything may seem like it's falling apart, we can still hold on to the promises of God. We can still be encouraged. We can still have peace, not because of ourselves, but because of what God has promised us in his word. In fact, Spurgeon once said that it is a strong consolation that can deal with the outward trials. Not your imaginary afflictions, but in the real afflictions and the blustering storms of life. Now, what I'm saying is that we need to believe what the Word of God says. Fully believe it. But the problem with fully believing something is that there's also that side of you that is fearful of whether or not it's trustworthy. (laughs) There's a little bit of fear involved. It's kind of like when you're a little kid and you can't really swim quite well yet, but you know that when you go to the pool, you want to get in the deep end of the pool. I don't know if you've ever done this, but I know that when I was a kid, I would go to the deep end of the pool and I would would hold on to the side of the pool and just kind of kick it around in the deep end like, well, this is cool to be here. (laughs) You know, you're not really swimming, but you're just kind of hanging on. The promises of God are something that calls us out of that place. The promises of God are something that calls us to let go of what we're holding on to and trust him out into the unknown. Whatever you're holding on to, it may be, it may be a, a, your pride, it may be sin, it may be you know, anxiety about what if God doesn't show up, it may be fear, whatever it is. But the promises of God draw us out out of our comfort zone, and causes us to trust him in the unknown. It's kind of like Peter, right? And in the church, usually we kind of harp on Peter because we're like, oh, man, you stepped out of the boat, but you sang. Man, why'd you sing, right? But I I always love to remind people, but he's the only one who ever walked on water. He's the only one who walked on water. He's the only one that said, Jesus, if that's you out there, I'll step out. That's what the promises of God are like. When we go through the storms of life, and remember, remember that scene. It was in a storm while everyone else was freaking out and worried about the waves and the wind. Peter was the only one that had his eyes on Jesus. He was the only one that thought about stepping out of the boat and trusting him in the unknown. And when we're holding on to things in our lives, our comfort zone, whatever that may be, it keeps us in the boat. It keeps us in the boat. If you want to grow in your walk with the Lord, if you want to know things about God that you've never known before, be willing to let go of your comfort zone. Be willing to let go of, I don't know how this is going to happen, but I have your promises, God. Your promises draw me out. Your promises encourage me to go forward, to let go and to trust you in what I don't know. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. 
For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It takes faith to believe in the promises of God, even when it feels like everything is falling apart, even when you feel like you don't understand the situation. But when you stand on the promises of God, God promises to sustain and to comfort and to bring you to where he wants you to be. It is the anchor that holds you together when it seems like everything is falling apart. And so the opportunity of adversity is that we get to see the faithfulness of God reestablished in our lives. Our final point is that adversity also shows us his power. Look with me at verses 9 through 13. And it says, So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish, of spirit and cruel bondage. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go in, tell Pharaoh king of Egypt to let the children of Israel go out of this land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips." Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the, children, uh, for the children of Israel and Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Now, after God had encouraged Moses, he spoke to him and said, hey, Moses, you can do this. I need you to go back to Pharaoh. I need you to go back to the children of Israel and to encourage them as well. And Moses did. He went back to the children of Israel and he was like, guys, we can do this. God is going to lead us out. But the children of Israel responded essentially by saying, we're not going to trust you anymore. (laughs) We are not going to listen to another word you have to say. Because the moment that we trusted you, everything got worse for us. Everything got harder for us. So why would we pay attention to you now? And who can blame them, right? But the problem that we find here is that When Moses first showed up, the children of Israel were excited about freedom. And then things didn't go as they expected. Things got harder. And a part of that problem is that they had been slaves for so long that they had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten that they were children of the promise. And because of the time that had gone on and because of how hard things had become, They struggle to believe the promises of God. And what I want to speak to somebody this morning is that I'm not in any way trying to make light of how hard your situation might be. But how hard your situation is doesn't mean that God's promises are null and void. It doesn't mean that he's not there with you. It doesn't mean that he's not going to show up. It doesn't mean that he's not providing, that he's not sustaining you. He's with you in the midst of that. But what the enemy wants to do is to use your situation to cause you to forget who you are. Oftentimes, we allow our circumstances to define our relationship with God. We allow the the setback or the trial or the struggle or the failed marriage to be the thing that, okay, see, that means that God doesn't exist. That means that God doesn't care. That means that God doesn't see and he's not involved in my situation. And that is not the truth. Now, can I stand here and tell you why something happened or didn't happen? Absolutely not. I don't know. I don't know why God does some of the things that he does. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that he's consistent in his presence. That even in the hardest of situations, he will show you his character. He will show you that he's walking with you. That he has not abandoned you. That he has not forsaken you. That he's not looking at you and saying, he's definitely not telling you this. If you had more faith, then maybe things would be better for you. No, 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 no. That's not what he's doing. But he's walking with you. He's caring for you. And even in the moments, even in my own life, where I've turned back and said, Lord, I am so sorry for how I complained or how mad I was or how... Whatever it is, I'm so sorry. Just like the prodigal child, God is always there with open arms. And it's usually when I turn around and press into him that I start to realize, oh, that's how you were there in that moment. That's how you showed up. 
You've been with me this entire time. He promised to never leave you nor forsake you, but what the enemy wants you to do is to forget that you are a child of the promise. He wants you to forget that God has made you more than a conqueror. That no matter what comes your way, you are victorious. Why? Because God has overcome the world. Jesus overcame everything, so that means that anyone who follows him will also overcome as well. We forget in this life, this isn't supposed to be the best life. This life is when we're on mission. And sometimes God will allow us to go through adversity. He will gift us. Can I say that? He will gift us adversity so that we could be a witness to the world of his grace. When I was 15 years old, I went through an injury where I, I, how do I explain this? Um... I went through an injury where I, I, I used to play football, and I was a football player, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play in the NFL, all these different things. And one day, I went to football practice after being on vacation in Florida. We came back, and you know, the coach, this, this, isn't, this is like freshman year of high school. The coach was telling all the football players, he was like, all right, you're going to get out there and run until I get tired. And you know, you naturally, you're like, I'm the one running. You're just standing there blowing a whistle. Yeah, I'm going to get tired. You ain't going to get tired. And everyone on the field had to run. And I was running. And I felt a pain in my lower back and my legs, and I just collapsed on the football field. I was going in and out of consciousness. They had to call the ambulance and all this different stuff. Come to find out I have this sickle cell trait, um, which causes your blood cells to twist. Anyway, I don't want to lose you on know, the jargon. Anyway, what was happening is that my, my body was shutting down. And they had, to, they had to perform some surgeries on my legs. And I had to, I lost the ability to walk for a long time. And I had to relearn how to walk. I had to relearn how to eat. I had to relearn how to just sit up and get dressed again. I had to relearn all of that. And in the midst of all of that, I just, I would be so mad at God. I would be like, why in the world would you let me go through this I didn't do anything to deserve it in my head. I, didn't, I wasn't out doing bad things. I wasn't sleeping around. I wasn't doing drugs. I was like, God, I did all this stuff. I, I was a church kid, pastor's kid, like, da, 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 whatever, with the VBS. And you let this happen to me? Why? And I used to be so mad at him. And there were years, years that I had struggles with God. Why, why, why? And what I learned in that season is that God does not answer that question. And I hope I can save a lot of you this morning from asking that question and expecting an answer. He doesn't answer that question. He will not tell you why. He will just show you who he is. That's the only thing that I know. I have learned to see that moment, because I'm still living with things with that, I still have to get up and I put these braces on my feet to help me walk and all this different stuff. I have to do that every single day. And I have learned and am continuing to learn that I have to look at that adversity as a gift because it presents an opportunity for me to minister for the Lord. And it presents an opportunity for his kingdom because he allowed me to go through that. That's not easy, and I didn't arrive at that in like two days or a Bible study or whatever it is, years. And there are some days I wake up and I still struggle with that. But if it wasn't for the adversity that I had faced in that time, I wouldn't be equipped to do what I'm doing now. One day my body will be whole when I step into heaven, and then I'm going to have a time of my life. For eternity, not for like 80 years, 70 years, 60 years, whatever it is, but forever. Do you understand this? Heaven is where the best life is supposed to be. So in the middle of where you're at right now, in the adversity of where you're at, can we change the perspective and say, I serve a God who can do the impossible in my marriage. 
I serve a God who can do the impossible in my finances, in my kids' lives, in my own personal life, in anything in my situation. I serve the God who can do the impossible. And whatever he's allowing me to face right now, it is not going to defeat me. It's just going to be used as a tool for the kingdom of heaven. He's going to use it in my life to, to impact somebody else. But it means believing his promises Believing that he keeps his promises. Don't forget who God has promised, what God has promised to you. The children of Israel forgotten, had forgotten who God had promised, what God promised to them, and, and who they were. In fact, even Moses forgot. <laughs> Moses struggled to believe that God would keep his promise. In fact, when we look at verse 12, Moses didn't respond in faith to God's encouragement, but he chose to focus on his inadequacies. He told God this. He said, I am of uncircumcised lips. In other words, he's saying, God, I can't do this. I don't have what it takes. Now, this isn't the first time that Moses used this excuse. Because the first time that he used this excuse, it was at the burning bush when God first called him. That's when he first said that. He said, I, I, I'm of uncircumcised lips. And God responded by saying, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what you will say. Now, in my mind, when I think about this moment, I'm like, okay, that should have been it for Moses. He should have known I can't use that excuse anymore because God already showed me that he will give me what, everything that I need in that moment, that I need to say something. But Moses brought this up again. Why? I believe he brought this up because many times when we run into adversity, we tend to magnify our negative quali qualities in an effort to understand why life is so difficult. We tell ourselves, I can't do this. Look at how I was raised. I can't do this. I don't have the education. I can't do this. I don't have the patience. Or even worse, we compare ourselves to other people. And in this moment, Moses is ready to give up on the mission. Not because God didn't equip him for the task, but because he was more focused on his ability rather than God's ability. And what we have to understand is that if you want God to call you to do something, understand that he will call you to do something that is always going to be outside of your ability. Nobody accomplishes anything great for God by relying on their own strength. Nobody. God will put you in situations and he will do things in your life so much so that at the end of it, the only thing that you will be able to do is to point to the ceiling and go, man, that was all the Lord. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. I don't know how that came through. And as a believer, that should be something that we boast in, right? In fact, this is something that Paul even knew. He said, Paul wrote this. He said, therefore, I will most gladly I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Sometimes many of us as Christians are always trying to appear like we are as strong as can be. We're as capable as can be. And if that's the front that we're putting up at church or wherever, our workplaces or whatever it is, then whatever you're fronting in front of people, that's all that they're going to see. In fact, it's actually just a facade because all of us are flawed. <laughs> all of us are weak. All of us have issues. Yet there's something that Paul understood here. He said, I will boast in my infirmities. I will boast in the issues. I will boast in the fact that I have flaws. Why? Because when God comes through, he's the only one that gets the credit. He's the only one that can do things outside of your ability. He's the only one that can make something that's impossible happen. But if we're trusting in our own strength, it won't happen. We have to be willing to say, God, I am going to depend upon you. And again, I'm not just talking about ministry here. Because some of you are looking at situations that seem impossible. 
whether that be in your marriage or in your family or whatever the situation that you're facing. But God wants to remind us all this morning that what we call impossible, God calls light work. Yes, it may be hard. It may be difficult. But what God is doing by allowing us to see how difficult something is, is to show us how much we need him. Because you know what's dangerous to the kingdom of darkness? Is a believer that is fully dependent on God. If we can get to a place where we start recognizing that we've got nothing in ourselves and that everything that we need is in God, that's when the kingdom of darkness becomes afraid. Because now you're operating from a place of dependency, not a place of self-sufficiency. And what our world tells us consistently is that you need to be self-sufficient. You need to be the only one. You need to be able to walk in a room, you know, chest first and be like, oh, yeah, I know how to do everything. No, 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 no. What what does scripture say? Pride comes before the fall. But the humble are upheld by the right hand of God. And so when we walk into a room, when you walk into a space, when you walk into a situation and you're fully dependent upon the Lord, that changes everything. Because now you're saying, God, I need you for every bit of this. God, I need you in my marriage. God, I need you in my job. I need you in all of the things that that are in front of me right now. I need you. And when you approach life that way, God shows up in a big way. That's when you see the power of God. Because then you start to see things happen that you couldn't have done on your own. Why? Because he was the one making it happen. He was the one making it go. Because we're fully depending upon him. That's how we see the power of God. It's not by us manipulating anything. It's not by us, you know, try, relying heavily on our, you know, try, religious practices or whatever it is, trying to, trying to manipulate God. But, oh, I prayed for 30 minutes, God, so that must mean you're going to show up. Or I read my Bibles for 30 minutes, God, does that mean you're going to show up? No, 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 no. It's just fully depending upon him, knowing that he loves you on your good days, on your bad days. Whether you read your Bible, read you did, whether you forgot that morning, whatever it is, he loves you the same. He's with you the same. He wants to work in your life the same. It's just about depending on him to come through and to fill places where you feel inadequate. And so the opportunity of adversity is that we get to see the power of God demonstrated in our lives. In conclusion, while adversity isn't fun... (laughs) It does provide us an opportunity to see God move in our lives like never before. It enables us to see more of his character, more of his faithfulness, and more of his power. But lastly, adversity also transforms. Do you remember Moses at the beginning, when we first started this at the beginning of of Exodus 6? Do you remember how afraid he was? Do you remember how timid he was? how unsure of himself he was? Well, as God allowed him to go through adversity, he began to change. He saw more of God's character, more of his faithfulness, and more of his power, so much that it transformed him. And proof of this is when we see the children of Israel, after they left Egypt, they get to the Red Sea. And when they get to the Red Sea, Pharaoh has a change of heart. (laughs) And he says, we're going to go get them. And he mobilizes his army, and they go out to go back to go recapture the Hebrews. And Scripture tells us that when the children of Israel realized that they were trapped against the sea, and that they and when they saw Pharaoh and his army coming, everyone panicked. Everyone was losing their minds. Everyone was scared, and they were, were, "Oh my! I can't believe we came out here. I can't believe we believed Moses. We're going to die out here, out here in the desert. What is going on? Everyone is panicking." In the midst of all of this, Moses alone stands up and he says this to the people. He says, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more forever. This is what adversity does to the believer. For the believer who trusts in God through the hard times, God uses that to craft you into a weapon. 
He uses it to craft you into the man or the woman of God that he has called you to be. So, so much so that when everyone is freaking out, when everyone is losing their mind, when everyone is, is falling apart, you are the one that's able to stand and say, God's going to come through for us. That is the opportunity of adversity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and uh, Lord, I will be the first to say, man, I, I, I have so much to work on when it comes to responding the right way in adversity. But Lord, I thank you so much for your, for your word. I thank you so much for being with us, Lord. I thank you so much for drawing us to you, for speaking to us the things that you wanted to speak to us. Lord, we thank you, God, for showing us a new perspective on what adversity is and, and how you work in the midst of it, God. Let us not leave here thinking that you are oblivious to our adversity or that you don't care or that you ignore us. God, help us to leave here confident, knowing that our God fights for us, that he sees us, that he knows our perspective, he knows how we feel, and that you will come through in your timing. I want us to understand whether you're whether you're in-house or whether you're listening, you're watching online or listening on the radio, that all this starts by entering into a relationship with Jesus. That's where all this starts. <laughs> he is the anchor in the midst of the storm. He's the one thing that holds you steady when everything is falling apart. And again, like I said earlier, I'm not saying that following Jesus will make life easier. But because he overcame the world, so will anybody who follows him. So if you're in-house or online or maybe you're listening on the radio, if you want to give your life to Jesus right now, or maybe if you want to rededicate your life to the Lord, all I want you to do is raise your hand and wave it at me, and I'll pray a prayer with you so that you can know him this morning. You just raise your hand and wave it at me. Amen. If you've raised your hand, I want you to pray this prayer out loud so that you can hear yourself say it. You're not praying to me. I'm just providing some guidance as you pray to the Lord. And just say, dear Lord Jesus, I want to give my life to you. Or I want to give my life back to you. Forgive me of my sins. I believe in your life, death, and resurrection for me. Make me new in the name of Jesus. Amen. For those of you that prayed that prayer, we want to welcome you to the family of God. <laughs> Trying to make heaven crowded. Amen. Well, maybe you're here this morning and you already believe in the Lord, but you're just going through it. Could you be bold and stand to your feet? I want to pray over you. If you're just going through it, you can be bold. Hey, this, <laughs> this ain't about anybody else in this room, all right? And just because I'm standing up here doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not going through something. I'm standing with you. But it, could you be bold in this room and stand? And for those of you that are standing, I want to thank you so much for your courage. And now, church, we get to be the body of Christ and that come around them. So if you're around them, would you mind reaching out a hand toward them? We're going to pray for them. I'm going to pray over you. Because my hands are raised too. Father in heaven, you know the details that we will never know. And yet we choose to trust you in this place. We choose to believe that the God who sent his son over 2,000 years ago did not ignore us in our adversity. This does not, he's not oblivious, but he's with us right here, right now. God, would you show those who have courageously stood in this place would you show them today that you are with them? Would you show them that they have a community of people who love them as well? Lord, would you show them that as they leave here today, Lord, you are going to provide the solution. You are going to provide a way. You are going to come through, Lord. And, and until you do, you're going to walk with us. You're going to walk with them. And you're going to show us things we've never seen before. You're going to use this season to draw us closer to you than ever before. But God, would you fill them with strength? Would you fill them with grace? Would you fill them with power? Would your presence be with them like never before? In the name of Jesus, amen.